that someone walks away after a day of training knowing how to do everything. So I, we, we kind of think about it you know, visually or figuratively as this kind of ocean full of fish. And, you, and those fish represent the features that are inside the program. And so it might be that as a result of going through that training, there may be five things that you will, I'm just using that number arbitrarily, but there could be five things maybe that you're going to work, work away with and saying, OK, I think I can do that. And those things might be, I think that if I've got the text existing electronically, the idea of adding instruction or voice notes to that text is something I could manage. Because you could say to yourself, I do it in Word anyway. If I was going to do a, word, a worksheet or a test, why not just do it in the Kurzweil tool? Uh, it's the same amount of time I would spend, except now I've made that curriculum accessible to, to, to make independent learning possible. Right? That's one example. Um, another thing might just be simply, excuse me, Uh, you know, just adding, adding in, you know, embedded instructions as we were just describing. As far then as, you know, becoming, getting to a point where you can do more, I think that just comes from, you know, implementing with fidelity. It's kind of having, I, I think of a kind of a game plan. The idea is that you don't just buy technology, get one day of training, and then just expect that you're going to pick it all up and figure it all out. You really have to have a well thought out plan. Um, that really kind of says, what are we doing over the next three years? So for example, right, here's something that we've been looking at with San Diego. You can imagine their challenge of how many teachers they're trying to get trained. Train the trainer has to be part of it ultimately, because as much as Bridges and us and other organizations out there we have perfectly, we have fantastic trainers and come in and train forever. But ultimately, there has to be some internal capacity within your district so that you've got people that are kind of local that can be kind of, you know, working with the same types of kids that can be helping you is number one. I, I think embracing the digital natives that you have in the class. Uh, so, you know, when you think about some of the things kids can be doing to, to help, so the Kurzweil Club idea, getting students to kind of help with that, that's another thing you can do and have those kids help the other kids. So I think ultimately the kids embrace of the tools. So things like using a dictionary, highlighting, making outlines and brainstorming, are things that you know you certainly might want to model at some point, but I think there's a lot of things, certainly as we've spoken about tier one and two, that the, the kids can be really doing for themselves. Is that is that helpful? Yeah, I just I just want some some thoughts. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Yeah, I can add to that a little bit. I've been struggling with that question for three years now, and I've tried different models. One was train the teacher, train the trainer. A lot of hours, a lot of money didn't work. So then the second model I tried was. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's just reaching, you know, continuing on with that model. Yeah, so teaching kids. Now, what age kids are we talking about? I'm talking about from grade five, uh, no, I'm thinking about grade three to eight. Grade three to eight. A variety of kids. So elementary, middle, okay. Yeah, so training kids, right? So again, it just go back to the whole digital natives thing. They're so more, much more open minded about it. And, mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing. Does anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Um, and I think some of these companies are clever to get, but um, either internally to the district or to try and, and possibly to post resources that they have created. I, 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 when I go to look with school districts, I talk about this all the time. I can't say that all of them do it, but why don't they now have somewhere where I made this, I can post this, you can use it, bring it down. Yes. All of you doing this one by one by one by one. We're going to kill ourselves. Yes. We have to start sharing the book. Yeah, I, that is an excellent point, by the way. It helps me to remember something that we hadn't spoken about yet on the classroom sweet side. So thank you. Uh, yes. I will. So the issue, anyway, is really kind of just talking about this ability to be able to share. So you've all heard the term reinventing the wheel. That's what's, I mean, um, sorry, what's your name, please? Kathy. Kathy. So what Kathy is basically speaking about is this this reinventing the wheel that we are all stuck in, right? We're all preparing sometimes the same texts, the same curriculums. We need to get ourselves to a point where we begin to share those materials. 
okay? So for example, um, Classroom Suite, some of you may know, has the activity exchange, okay? So there are 36, 3,700 um, activities on the activity exchange that have been placed there by other educators from around the world, and they are free. You can go there and download them. If you go to the Kurzweil website, there are lesson plans that teachers have created talking about how Kurzweil 3000 is used by their students working in social studies class or English class or whatever it might be. You can search by grade, search by content area, and again, these are free resources. So why go and reinvent the wheel, to Kathy's point? Let's learn to share. Um, you know, and there are listservs. I mean, obviously, there are plenty you could belong to, and I'm sure if you're like me, you get more email than you care for, so you want to be kind of very careful about how many more lists you're joining. Uh, but there are plenty of lists out there, though, where you can interact with, with other educators that are using either our technology or other technology. Again, the strategies aren't rocket science per se. And you know, so if we've got something that helps with fluency in Kurzweil, there's a good likelihood there are other tools out there that can help you do the same thing. So share. You know, forget about what it is you're using. Just, I think, focus on the student need. So I'm trying to address the need of fluency. And then you'll kind of just see what other people are doing to help in those areas. I think probably is a more helpful way of going about it. So thank you, Kathy, for sharing. That's great. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So um, was it Janet? Oh God! Wow, I remembered. I'm amazed. So uh, Janet's point then is talking about the help videos. Okay, and they may exist for other programs too, but certainly in Kurzweil 3000, you can go into the help menu. It says help videos, it's pretty clear. And there's 20 videos uh, that will get you through the, the most basic uh, functions in the program, probably the ones that you will use the most. Uh, if you even just took the trial CD, right? there's actually two, two CDs in here. One is the actual software that you can try out for 30 days. The other one, though, is a compilation of uh, seven or eight videos, which are also on the website. If you were to watch every single video, it would take you about 45, 50 minutes. But it goes into a good amount of detail about how you might use Kurzweil 3000 from a study skills perspective. And that might go into some detail then about highlighting and outlining and column notes and all that good stuff. There'll be, there'll be videos about writing and the different strategies that you can use. So that's probably a good way as well. You could even have the kids watch those. And that probably would be all they need. And I will tell you from personal experience, having trained kids myself on occasion, 90 minutes, the kids actually are just too, just too impatient. I'm not even going fast enough. And they're, they just got it. Teachers, of course, on the other hand, you know, it's six hours for one day. And that <laughs> sometimes isn't enough. Um, but, you know, but again, that I think just speaks to the, the digital natives. So, yeah. You have a I comment? Think also for the professional development piece for, for teachers, um, capturing some of your workshops using something like Adobe Captivate where you're you're able to then place it on an e-learning module so that teachers can go back to it and review it again um, is another strategy that we're using for our classroom teachers. So e-Captivate? Is this an it's Adobe product? Adobe Captivate. Adobe, oh, sorry, Adobe Captivate, right. And so you're just basically, you're, are you got like video recording um, presentations? Yeah, exactly. You're recording your presentation and you can go back to it at another point in time. Yeah, so I guess that kind of speaks to uh, podcasts too, right? Same. So you could actually also then publish some of your materials then out to the Apple Store, the, I, the iTunes Store, um, perhaps. I, I know there are certainly schools that are out there doing that. Any other strategies that anyone has for, for helping with that kind of training piece that hasn't been mentioned so far? No? OK, well, Steve, I think we're um, getting back to your slides. So you may want to come up here and uh, take over at this point. I haven't got the clicker. It was on your well, machine. You've got the full uh, presentation. Yes, I do. Right? Okay. And you are hooked up to the internet. I am hooked up to the internet. Okay. And I'll give you one the microphone. Yeah, I want to be able to show a site in a moment. I'll, That's I'll come back to you. Yeah. I'm not saying that I don't have to click on it. I have to manually click the arrow. Is that all right? Yeah, it's fine. Uh, okay, so so that was a that was a nice discussion of of tier one, tier two, tier three, uh, and how how um, technology can help us. And, and uh, I will tell you that I've learned a great deal um, in the brief period of time that we have been a new merged company because uh, Voyager did a magnificent job of blending technology into each of its tier two interventions. 
Uh, and so I, I, I'd suggest you might want to look at our website, cambiumlearning.com, and just take a look at how that's done because it's, it's uh, um, there's even an international uh, math competition that's a part of VMath uh, that kids can get on uh, that is really fun. And there are thousands of kids around the world that get involved with this international math competition. That's a good use of, of uh, a reinforcement for technology. So what I want to do is, is in, the, in our remaining time, I want to take you through the rest of this model quickly to kind of talk about how this might be um, used. The, the, the next, the next uh, part of the model is um, uh, the issue of instruction. And um, uh, let's just talk just for a moment about that just to kind of be sure we're on the same wavelength about this. Um, David Tilly is a person who is the, in charge of accountability for a place called the Heartland Area Education Agency in Des Moines, Iowa in the United States. Uh, that he is one of the three generals of the RTI Revolutionary Army in the United States. You can tell me who the RTI Revolutionary Army officers are here. I would tell you that the superintendent in Regina is an example of one um, uh, from the people that I know well here. And, and uh, Dave is somebody who has been doing this RTI thing for 20 years across the state of Iowa. And so he really gets this point. This is what he says is the big, big idea behind RTI. And you'll notice that it's the big, big idea behind good teaching. So it's not, this is not really a, a different thing that we're talking about here. Um, I, would, I would share with you that there are several authors that are now talking about the great need to really firm up what we mean by good instruction. And obviously, you could use technology to help model what you would expect teachers to do by showing great examples. Uh, I'm the lead author on a teacher evaluation system that, that uh, uh, was used um, uh, for, for a, a long period of time in Utah and other places. And it was called the Scales for Effective Teaching, and it was based on the effective schools literature. And we used, we used video to help uh, um, 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 produce reliability across the raters. So the, all the principals would look at a set of videos. Uh, and the, the people who were more expert with the system would look at the same videos to see if we came to the same conclusions about, about uh, the teaching of the, of the folks that we were looking at. So having that kind of reinforcement would make some sense. Having that reinforcement for coaching makes some sense as well. I've used that system um, with a, a video camera in the back of the room and have the teacher uh, uh, just click it on and do a lesson for 30 minutes and then send that, send that, um, that video along um, uh, digitally. Now, of course, that can be done so much easier. Um, I wanted to share with you that this is my favorite book on uh, the issue of instruction right now. It's a book by Marzano, uh, published in 2007, called The Art and Science of Teaching. These are the 10 questions that Marzano says we should be paying attention to. If you look carefully through the questions, uh, you will notice that it's a combination of relationship and structure. Um, the one thing that the effective schools literature has taught us in 40 years is that that's what teaching is. It's a combination of structure and relationships. It isn't just relationships. It isn't just structure. It's a combination of structure and relationships in order to be successful with kids. And that's uh, really what this is talking about. This is a great rubric for doing coaching with teachers to see what the answers to those questions might be, I think, and, and uh, a, a very helpful sort of a tool, I think. Um, and, and uh, uh, I wanted to show you quickly this issue as well, because uh, if you are in a place that stresses um, English as the primary language and, and uh, you are not bilingual in your approach, if that's true, um, uh, there is uh, some really good data that's come forward um, in 2007 by Russell Gersten, a great researcher in the United States, on the issue of English language learning. And what he did was a meta-analysis of what we know about good instructional strategies for helping those kids to become expert at the English language. And this is what they came up with through that meta-analysis. And when you look at that list, it is not different than what we should be doing for all kids. Uh, isn't that interesting? Isn't that, that, that the, one, the one issue that I think is an intriguing one that is somewhat controversial, um, in, in the United States at least, is this issue, the word academic in front of English. Um, that that uh, it, it appears clear that if you want kids to compete uh, in a culture that uh, is dominated by a language different than the one they have, then you have to really help them to be able to become expert at the academic version of that language that, that would reflect their ability to be able to compete. So that's, that's the, um, the issue. Um, and little, little stupid things about technology about this. Um, uh, I love a scotch that is, uh, has the name O-B-A-N. Um, uh, my good friend in, in Longmont, Colorado, where I live, is named Stu Horsfall, and he's from York in England. And um, he is promising to take me 
to uh, um, 